Okay, I think we're going to so we'll get started. Okay, everyone, please get seated. Is it run? Please, please be seated. <laughs> please be seated. Hello. Ah, there we go. I got your attention. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you for coming uh, to the IMA public lecture. Uh, my name is Fadil Santosa. I'm the director of the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications. Since 1982, the IMA has been the Mathematical Science Research Center where mathematicians work closely with scientists, engineers on problems arising in the fields outside of mathematics, such as physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, and industry. In fact, today's talk is going to be about, not, not loud enough? Louder, okay, that's better. All right, so I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Lisa Fauci. Dr. Fauci received her PhD degree from the Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences at, at New York University in 1986. In the same year, she joined the faculty of Tulane University in New Orleans, where she has been since, since then. She now holds the Pendergraph Nola Lee Haynes Professorship in Mathematics, and she's also Associate Director of the Tulane Center for Computational Science. Among the many honors Dr. Fauci has received in her career, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship in 1992. Uh, these fellowships are in recognition of distinguished performance and unique potential to make substantial contribution to their field. Uh, the Tulane University Liberal Arts and Science Faculty Research Award in 1999 and in 2012, Dr. Fauci was elected fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. The citation for this uh, fellowship reads, for, co for contribution to computational biofluid dynamics and, it, and, their, and its applications. Indeed, this is the topic of a presentation tonight, uh, which is entitled, you can see the title there, Waving Tails, Spiny, spiny Disc and Sticky Situation, Exploration in Biological Fluid Dynamics. So please join me in welcoming Professor Lisa Fauci. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And Fadil, you weren't supposed to tell them what year I got my PhD, okay? But that's okay. I was, I was, a, a, we, I was a prodigy back then. Okay, so I guess that there are a lot of young students here, and you're all sitting in the back. But there are a couple of brave ones, but I, I can see you, so just be careful. All right, so like uh, Fadil said, I am a mathematician. My training is in applied mathematics, and I, you'll see during this talk that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about problems in biology. I think the last time I actually took a biology class was, was in high school. So I learned a lot of biology from on, on the streets, but really um, from, from collaborations. So what I hope that I, the, the message that I give today is that, uh, is that nowadays, if one wants to make meaningful contributions to science, one, one way of doing that is in is with collaborations, where you at least accept that you're never going to be an expert in experimental biology or, or computational chemistry or, uh, or applied mathematics all at once, but when you work together in teams, you learn from each other and, and can bring something different to the table, and the outcome is, uh, could be fun and interesting. So, what I'm going to tell you about is uh, our projects that our group at Tulane and collaborators have been working, about, working on and thinking about for, for a long time. And so here's some example of, of waving tails. And in fact, much of my work these days has been driven by trying to understand the basic mechanics and biochemistry of mammalian reproduction. And so, Let's see, where's my, some, is this working? I have to turn something on here, so, okay. You will turn it on for me. And I press this. Okay, great. So, so here is just a, a, a beautiful micrograph of, of, of sperm-egg interaction. And it's a very 
beautiful example of, of the interaction of structures that are moving through a, a fluid. And so here I'm, I'm, I'm showing you the kind of waving tails that I'm looking at. Um, here you can, you can see going back and forth across the screen uh, a, a sperm cell. You see the nice uh, sinusoidal beat of the, of, the, of the flagellum as this swims across the, the stage. So here, this is about 100 microns, very, very tiny. And here, the spirochete, I put that up here because this, this, I'm not going to talk about um, the spirochete locomotion, but this was a collaboration that I had with a faculty member here at the University of Minnesota um, about a decade ago. Okay, so there are some waving tails. And what about some spiny disks? So I'm also going to talk about, um, about diatom motion and other phytoplankton motion in, in the ocean. And so there are some very unlikely looking uh, Creature. So these. So here, this is not a spaceship. This is this is a single diatom cell, and it's mostly made out of silica. And um, here, you can see that that in this particular case, it has a bunch of spines coming out of it. And some of these diatom chain diatoms also live in colonies in the form of chains. So where we have two cells connected to each other. Here is an example, not of sp a spiny diatom, but of a, a, a different species of diatom that, that where you can see the individual ch uh, cells and they, they, do, they do attach together and form chains. And so one of the questions that, that uh, might, might come up is why do they form chains? So these diatoms are phytoplankton and they're responsible for much of the primary production. So if all the diatoms were to disappear, we'd be in really deep trouble because we need oxygen to breathe. So, I, um, w so one question could be, why do they form chains? And are these chains rigid? Some are rigid, <coughs> some are flexible, and why is that? So what, it, what are the evolutionary advantages of, these, of, of cells actually forming these colonies and chains, and, and what are the advantages or disadvantages of them being stiff or flexible? So these are very simply stated questions that really, in, in order to answer them, you want to understand the fundamental environment that they live in. They live in a fluid environment, and you also want, want to understand the chemistry of, uh, that surrounds them. You want to understand how they are uptaking nutrients and so on in this fluid environment. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you some, some problems that we, I worked on with a group of oceanographers and biologists at the University of, of Maine that uh, centered around diatoms. Uh, another kind of dinoflagellate that if I have some time, I will show you some, um, some uh, investigations of are, are dinoflagellates. And these here, these dinoflagellates are, 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 again, unicellular organisms, but unlike, unlike diatoms, they are actually motile. So has anyone ever heard of dinoflagellates before? We're the high school bio student. Some people raise their hand. Um, dinoflagellates are, uh, uh, they are responsible, if you've ever heard of, red tide. Okay? Did anybody hear of red tide? Okay, so those are just an overabundance of a particular dinoflagellate species. And um, some of you, are, if your parents uh, give you the, put you the money to go to spring break to Puerto Rico sometime, you could go, there are, there are luminescent bays or fluorescent bays. Did anyone ever hear about that, where you go there at night and they, the boat takes you out and you put your hand in the water and the, whole, the water lights up? Those are dinoflagellates because they have, uh, they're, they're luminescent. I'm not going to talk about that. So yeah, that's a good science field trip to, for your parents to send you on. Okay. So what do th these spiny disks and these waving tails and the sperm and the spirochete have in common? All of them are living in a fluid environment, and the fluid environment does does uh, really determine their, their, their function. So one other, 
one other thing that we're looking at. Where's the sticky situation? So there's a cow. And I took this slide from my collaborator, Susan Suarez, who is a sperm physiologist um, at, at Cornell. And what happens is, and this happens in humans as well, that every, you, you, you've, you know, ev everybody thinks that there's all these millions of sperm racing to actually fertilize the egg in mammal. And that's true at the start. There are millions of sper tens of millions of sperm that are introduced into the female reproductive tract. But out of those, only 10% make it through the, to the cervix. I guess I should have had on my birds and bees slide because I bet you everybody doesn't know where fertilization occurs. But, well, you, you basically, you, you have the ballpark. But in fact, fertilization does not occur in the uterus. The sperm have to make it through the cervix, into the uterus, down the fallopian tube all the way to the end where the ovary has released the egg. So by the time that fertilization occurs, you may think that there are millions of sperm who are all trying to be the one to fertilize the egg, but in fact, the ones that actually make it through to the journey to in the vicinity of the egg are more on the order of 10 to 20. Okay? So there's a lot of interesting uh, fluid mechanics and biophysics that, uh, that are going on in mammalian reproduction. So here's, you know, here's the picture. This, a bunch of these sperm make it through um, the uterus, and then they get into the fallopian tube or the oviduct. But in fact, much of, many of them get stuck there. So here's, you know, here's, I'm not really telling you what you see, but you see this wiggling. Here, these are sperm cells, and they're stuck somehow. But something happens, and that, so, so these sperm are just hanging out, stuck to oviductal folds, but then in the, in, at some point when ovulation occurs, where the egg is ready to be uh, fertilized, some biochemical signal, perhaps mediated by, by muscular contractions of the oviduct, somehow there's a signal that this egg sends to these, to these sperm, and then they change their beating pattern. Instead of beating in a normal way, I'll show you that in a minute, they, they beat with a very large amplitude wave that's asymmetric. And the idea is, once they get the signal, their change in their beat pattern enables them to exert enough force to pull themselves off of, off of the oviduct. So I'm just giving you some background as to the kind of, the kind of problems that we've been thinking about and what they, what they do all have in common is this, that whether we're, we're looking at, at, the, at the diatoms moving in the ocean or at these uh, sperm trying to get, get off of the oviduct and fertilize the egg, we have a coupled system. We have these, uh, I'm calling them microorganisms, and they're interacting somehow with their environment. And these, these microorganisms you could think of as exerting force on the surrounding fluid. Now, the sperm is exerting active force. It's, um, it's, um, I won't tell you all the details of it, but, but the sperm actually have, the sperm flagellum has molecular motors that are causing microtubules to slide, causing a bending pattern. And that is, uh, that is interacting with the fluid. The diatom chains and those spiny discs that I showed you, they are non-motile. They don't, they're, they're not flexing or anything. They're, passively moving with the fluid flow, but they are exerting force because they are, they are passive elastic structures, and they're exerting some type of, of elastic force there. So all of these examples that I showed you are, um, are, are generally described by a coupled fluid structure system. And I'm going to show you the kind of equations that one, one has to solve when you're looking at these. But the other thing that these examples have in common, and I know in my abstract I talked about fish swimming, but I'm not going to talk about fish swimming today at all. But what all of these have in common is that these are, uh, these are at the micro scale. 
So length scales are very tiny. So we're talking about, um, about things that on the order of 100 microns. And you could, um, you should, all the high school students should know how many microns in a millimeter. Does anyone know? 10 to the something. Anyway, a millimeter is a, a millimeter is maybe 1,000 microns. Do you think? 10,000? OK, I'll vote for 1,000. OK, so we are looking at fluid mechanics at a very tiny length scale. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting here a paper from a, a fit by a physicist back, in the, back in, the, in the 70s called Life at Low Reynolds Number. So in, in fluid mechanics, there is a quantity in that really characterizes the type of flow, and it's called the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number is a way of measuring the relative importance of inertial forces to viscous forces. And so you know, just think about this as, a, this as a number, as a, a, a ratio that tells you how important viscosity is or the stickiness of the flow compared to inertia. Now, you've all experienced inertia. We use that term in everyday, in everyday language. When you're, when you're in a swimming pool and you, you uh, kick off the side of the pool and then stop at moving every part of your body, you will still continue going because there is inertia. You know, the fluid has some memory of you exerting force on it. So that's a case when we talk about Reynolds number, for a man swimming, we have uh, the inertia is much more important than the stickiness or the viscosity of the fluid. If you go down to the level of sperm cells or bacterial cells, everything switches. In that case, uh, 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 their uh, inertia is almost negligible. And what does that mean? That means if, if so here, uh, Purcell put this in a very nice way. Uh, that for a man to swim at the same Reynolds number as a bacterium, you put him in a swimming pool full of molasses and forbid him to move any part of his body more than one centimeter per minute. So this is what forces, this is what the fluid mechanics, uh, that this is what the fluid mechanics of a microorganism, a spirochete, uh, sperm cell is experiencing. Anything from your experience of swimming when one tries to understand swimming at the micro scale is totally off. So if that sperm cell was to stop, were to stop uh, undulating its tail, it wouldn't coast at all. Everything would stop dead. There's no inertia. So to, to show you some implications of this, I'm going to um, show you something that's pretty interesting. So here, this is G.I. Taylor himself, who is, is passed away, but he's a, a famous British fluid mechanician. And here is going to be an experiment at very low Reynolds number. So there's a vat of glycerin, and he put in a blob of dye. And now he's turning that. And so you can, you can see you don't see that blob any longer. So here, when, I'm, when I say that this is a vat of glycerin, it is not water. It's really sticky, thick, viscous fluid. OK, so now he's mixed that. Now he's going to stop. And now he is going to turn the crank in the opposite direction. And there's very viscous, inertia-free flow. And something's going to happen. Go a little more quickly. What do you think of that? We did not run the movie backwards. So this is something really amazing that, uh, well, that here the flow is, was completely reversible. That stirring, the, the sequence of the stirring motion was reversed perfectly, and everything ended up where it was in the beginning. So what this means for microorganisms is that microorganisms can't swim like this, okay? 
what am I, you know, I, I promised myself I wouldn't do these hand motions, but here I am. So this is a reversible motion. If a, if a microorganism was to push fluid down in this direction, maybe it would go up like that. But if it would take its appendage and move it through the exact sequence of steps back to the original position, it would just go exactly back where it started from. So what I want you all to think about is how does sperm oscillating motion not violate that condition that I told you? Okay. So that's, uh, if there are any, any of the teachers here, these are good homework problems. Okay. So why, I've been thinking about these problems, like Fadil said, for decades. And, and in, in fact, studying flow and swimming at the micro scale has gone through a renaissance in the past five years or so. Why is that? Because of the advent of microfluidic devices and nanotechnology, people now are looking at the possibility of creating synthetic microorganisms that can be used to, for example, to drug delivery, to target tumors and so forth. So here, if you want to uh, put a payload of some sort of drug on this um, manufactured spirochete and get it to the infected cells, you want to be able to guide it through a fluid environment. So in fact, one really needs to understand fluid dynamics at the level of microorganisms. So, so while here is a case I was having a discussion with some of the students today, here is a case where just understanding the basic science, just for the heck of it, wanting to understand about how spirochetes or bacteria move through fluid, can have now a real impact for, in technology development. And you, and you know what? You don't know when that's going to happen when you're doing the basic science. It could happen 10 years later. Someone might realize that's what we really need to know. OK. So um, in fact, uh, the other technological advance that's well, more than five years old is, is, um, is, looking at, is, the, is manufacturing of microfluidic devices here, where you set up, a, the expression is setting up a lab on a chip, where you have these tiny um, canals of, of fluid where you could, where you could look at very uh, deliberate experiments at the micro scale. So in, in the past five or 10 years, there's really been a resurgence of trying to understand fluid dynamics at this, at this micro scale. And one intriguing thing is um, what, about, what about mixing fluid at this, at this level? And, one in, in, and, and that, that's uh, just, that's for fun there, this mixer here. But there were a group of, of people um, out of Harvard University and, and others who thought about taking actual biological matter like bacterial cells and putting them in these microscopic devices and using the natural rotation of their, of their, um, of their flagellum to actually mix things at the micro scale. And you'd just give them some glucose every once in a while and they'd keep mixing this up. Now, um, one, one, I, I'm just putting this up here because looking at using bacteria as, um, as uh, effective mixers in microfluidic devices, uh, one might want to move around not just point particles in fluid, but may maybe vesicles of some sort. And so this was here because I'm at, at the IMA. I'm, I'm showing, I was at the IMA a year and a half ago and working with a, a group of women in one of the WAM programs where we actually developed computational simulations of, of helical flagella that are actually pushing some elastic vesicle. And we had a follow-up meeting. I wanted to show this to Fidel. We had a follow-up meeting in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. And one of, so it's, it's all good. And so this, this work is being, um, published in, in one of the IMA journals. So there's, I've given you some motivation as to, as to the kind of problems we're looking at. And, and hopefully that you, un, that you understand that there are some equations that we want to solve. I keep emphasizing that we want to solve the equations of, of fluid dynamic and be able to predict what flow looks like around these structures and so on. And so before, I've, I've shown you um, lots of different vignettes of different problems. And 
I ask, we have to, before we start on any large scale computation, one thing that we might, and, and in all of science, we want to be able to ask these questions. Before we say, let's study it, we should ask the question, what do we want to learn? You know, then we should face the fact that there are going to be complications and try to identify those complications. And then we may want to make some choices to try to learn things bit by bit. So I took this slide years ago from a computational scientist, um, Chris Johnson at University of Utah, who, um, who described mathematical modeling in, a, in, in, a, in these pictures. So we, we want to capture the entire bull, but that's really too, one, one accepts that that's really complicated, that's really too hard. So we start trying to just take pieces of the bull that are the most important. And we start, that's still too difficult, we start taking away that and, try, and, and again try to keep the most important features, and then we end up with something like that. So, uh, you know, here mathematicians are happy and, and, and many scientists are first to try to try to understand the very basic bull where b before we put in all of the skin and muscles and everything else. So in the time that I have left, I want to take you through a, a tour of some of the questions that we want to answer and some of the results that we have. So I told you we talked about sperm motility. And so here um, in, in, in the normal part of the reproductive cycle, when the sperm are introduced into the uterus and things are moving around, or if you take these sperm, these mouse sperm, and put them on a slide, they um, are going, they're undergoing this symmetric flagellar beating. They beat, they swim pretty much straight. They pass a wave in one direction, they swim in the other. Now I told you that during mammalian reproductive, there is a phase that comes about through biochemical signaling, which is where the sperm undergo what's called hyperactive motility. And so I saw this happen with my own eyes in Susan Suarez's lab. She was able to affect this biochemical change by um, just putting a drop of thimerosal on the slide. And those sperm that were swimming nice and straight, you know, kind of go nuts. Look at, that, look, look at that sperm here. It's swimming in circles. So instead, uh, instead of having a nice symmetric sinusoidal beat, it if you take a freeze frame, it looks something like that. So what is, you know, what is the functional significance of this change? And so what we wanted to do is to, dis is to, is to describe the coupled fluid system of this elastic sperm flagellum with the surrounding fluid. Okay? I told you that I'm a mathematician, and now I'm going to spend 20 minutes going over these equations. Not true. But what are we solving here? I put this all up for you. But what we want to solve here, we want to solve conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. So you all know Newton's law, right? Force equals what? Mass times, mass times acceleration. So um, you may not recognize it here, but this first equation where u is fluid velocity, rho is fluid density, this is just, this is mass times acceleration. So these are, t these are this is a, a partial differential equation. It says mass times acceleration equals a whole balance of forces. And those forces are due to pressure, to fluid viscosity, and to the elasticity of the, of the structure. Okay? I'm just throwing this up here. I mean, many of you are high school students. Some of you have seen calculus, and you know what derivatives are. So hiding in here is a derivative of velocity with respect to time, which is an acceleration. But time is not the only variable anymore. We have three spatial dimensions, and we have other complications. So all of these, everything that you see here are, are derivatives with respect to time and space and other things. So we do have underlying, um, under, underlying equations that we want to, to solve for the fluid velocity. And, in, and from that, we can write down the equations, but there's no way of solving these complicated problems analytically with a closed form solution. 
So we take these equations and we discretize them and do other, we, we use state-of-the-art numerical algorithms, which, is, you know, which, which have been developed over, over the past um, you know, 20, 50 years. And now, even finding ways of solving these equations in, in fast and accurate ways change when computer architecture changes. So if you, if, if you had, uh, if you're doing computations on your laptop or you're doing computations on a server that's got thousands of GPUs, you might want to have different algorithms. So there's lots of interest in underlying all of this in, in, computation, in computation. So the other kind of force that I want you to think about are forces due to springs. So we know force equals mass times acceleration. And basically, the, I'm, going to sh I'm going to soon show you just a whole bunch of different simulations. But the way that we're going to model much of these structures is by series and collections of springs. So you know that if you have two points connected by a spring, if you remember Hooke's law, it says that the force that this that the, the force is going to be proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. So if you have a rest length L, then the force is going to be the distance between the endpoints of your spring over L minus one times times some spring constant. And it's it's a vector force. So if the distance between the two points is exactly the rest length, then your force is zero. Otherwise you have force you you have force either pulling it out if it's compressed or pushing it back together if it's extended. But somehow we're going here, I've, I've drawn pictures of springs, but the force is going to, the spring is then we're going to take it and put it in a fluid. Just like a sperm tail is sitting in a fluid, we take the force from the spring, put it in the fluid, and as that spring either expands or contracts, it creates some fluid flow around it. Okay. So, let me get back to the, the hyperactivation question so the, or the problem. So we could ask ourselves a bunch of different questions. We could ask, what is causing that sperm cell to change its waveform? What, what's the biochemistry involved there? We could also ask what I've highlighted in blue. Let's say that we don't really care how it happens. We're going to ignore all the biochemistry. But we could ask, given that it happens, given that this waveform changes from being symmetric in small amplitude to asymmetric in high amplitude, given that, what, can we, what, what are the functional implications of that? Is that true? Is that really making it easier to pull off of the oviduct? Or perhaps, is that making it easier for the cell to actually penetrate the egg? So, so I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm skipping over this, but we, we have some answers to the first part where we tried to capture some of the biochemistry. And what I'll show you here, if I can, are, you know, here, this, these look like cartoon simulations, but we're really solving the full three-dimensional um, equations of fluid mechanics. And these are three different simulations. And in, in this red swimmer here, We've actually included, uh, we've included some biochem biochemistry that, that, um, that, tr that changes the amplitude and time. And you see we get this nice swimming in, in circles. Okay. So the blue one is the boring symmetric sperm swimmer. Okay. But now what we wanted to do is to take this, this um, activated, this hyperactivated sperm and see what happens when it approached a wall, when it was stuck to a wall, and to see how it could actually possibly pull off. So here is an example. I'm showing you a couple of simulations here. But here is a wall. And here I, I, I highlighted the spring. And I'm showing you the tip of the flagellum. And now these are within computational simulations. But what we do is, when the tip of the flagellum gets close to the wall, a spring is created. And when it gets stretched beyond a certain amount and has some other properties, we can break it. So let's see what happens here. So let's just look at, at uh, this example here. 
So these are three sperm cells that are hanging around near a wall. And I'm not depicting the springs for you, but what I'm showing you is that the red curve, the red curve is actually getting that hyperactivated waveform. It's got a, it's, we're solving the, the biochemistry equations that are, that are giving it its waveform. And in fact, it does generate enough pulling force to keep attaching and reattaching. And this kind of thing, has, these, this, this, this phenomenon of hyperactivated sperm that where, they, where it continually attaches to oviductal epithelia, pulls off and comes back on, has, just, has been recently um, measured in experiments in, in our collaborator's lab. So um, really what needs to be done here in a model like this is to try to include, is to try to understand more about the binding properties. What I've done here is I, I've told you that what we included forces that when, when the nose gets close enough to a wall, we create a spring. When that spring gets stretched beyond a certain amount, we, we un, undo it. Uh, what we would like to understand is more of what, what the real binding properties of that, uh, that are on the sperm head, what those are. Um, so here's, some, here's another fun movie. And in fact, sperm don't usually swim through nice Newtonian or homogeneous fluids. They're sw swimming through very complicated mucosal complex fluids. So here's a, an example. Just This is a for fun example, but this was work that um, we did two summers ago with two undergraduates at Tulane in an REU program. And so here's a swimming sperm swimming through a bunch of elastic mucus polymers. And uh, there you go. They named, they named this sperm Henry. Okay. But in fact, we are writing this up for a publication. Um, here, more recently, a couple of postdocs that we're working with are trying to look at the forces that it takes for a sperm to penetrate the, um, the, uh, the, the zona pellucida of, of, uh, of a real ovum. So here, oops. You know, there's here. I, I do like um, Yatsik's computer graphics here. So here we actually are modeling the um, viscoelastic uh, egg coating. And what we really want to understand are the forces that it takes to actually cut through those, uh, the, the viscoelastic network. OK. So there's my sticky situation and some waving tails. What I want to tell you about right now are some of the, dyna the, the, the spiny disks and the, and the dinoflagellates. So one thing that I learned from my, um, from my oceanographer collaborators is, I guess this, they learned this in Physical Oceanography 101, everything could be approximated by an ellipse, OK? Because if one wants to study an, uh, the, the rotation of an ellipse, in a shear flow, and I'll show you what I mean by that, um, there is an analytical solution. So here, just to orient you, here's a f uh, an ellipse that's flipping around. So it's a shear flow looks something like this. Here on the top, flow is moving quickly in this direction. At the bottom, it's moving in that direction. And then it, there's a linear gradient. And at the center, the velocity would be 0. So if you were a point sitting right on the center, you wouldn't move. But you're, if, you were, if you were a sphere sp sitting right at the center of this, the top is being pushed in this direction, the bottom is being pushed in the other, you would rotate. Okay. So why do people care about shear f ellipses and shear flow? First, let me tell you about shear flow. It is thought that at the level of phytoplankton, that turbulence is experienced, if you took a microscope and focus in, it is thought that turbulence is experienced locally as shear. So understanding the environment and the, and the nutrient, nutrient acquisition uh, properties at the scale of phytoplankton, um, it, is, that w it is, is thought that studying how these phytoplankton move in a linear shear flow will give you a lot of information. The other thing that I'm telling you is that 
if you put an ellipsoid at the center of a shear flow, it depends on the aspect ratio of that ellipsoid. It's the, the, the ratio of, its sh of the length of its short axis to its long axis. That will tell you how long it takes for this ellipse to flip around, its period of motion. Biologists and oceanographers, they think that the period of motion of a diatom or an ellipsoid is important to know because it tells you how long it takes for, this, for, the, for the cell to experience or to, 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 uh, to, to experience its environment, how much nutrient it could take. So oceanographers approximate everything by ellipsoids because there's an exact solution. So the question that our, that our oceanographer collaborators asked is why do some of these cells have spines? So I showed you the species of diatoms that have spines. And the question was, besides buoyancy, does some of the, do these spines alter the period of rotation at the level of a shear flow? And so they thought, so here, I, I guess I was talking to Lauren about this today. We started this collaboration, two experimentalists and, a couple, and, and, and me, a mathematician computational person. And it took a while for us to understand what our capabilities were, what each other's capabilities were. And it also uh, took a while to, to even try to come down to a very clean question like this. How do these spines, if I take this a, a disk and I put spines on it, Will it rotate in the same shear flow? Will it rotate more quickly, or will it rotate more slowly? This was the this was the this was the problem we decided we would think about first. Our experimental collaborators thought that maybe computationally this would take us about a week or two to figure out. It took us about a year to get the code up and running because this is a complicated problem. This we had to somehow uh, out the postdoc that worked with. Us, Hoa Wynn, she was a specialist in, in grid generation and complex 3D structures. And so we did this and, uh, and did the runs. And you know, we, got, we, we calculated it. We put this in a shear. And this thing went round and around. And we figured it out. And so I didn't think this was a very exciting project at, uh, to begin with. We were just calculating. Calcu using lots of computer hours and, and using adaptive grid refinements in, in, in full 3D to calculate this. And so the question is, we may always ask ourselves this question as a computational fluid dynamics, was it really necessary? Did we have to do this? So here, so there's a few answers to that. And, and one, of, one of the answers may be no. But how would we know if we didn't do it? How would we know what the answer was if we didn't actually do the detailed calculations? So this is actually a really good middle school um, extra credit assignment. Because now, if you were an oceanographer and you didn't have access to computational fluid dynamics people to do this, and you were faced, I'll show you what we have here, you, and you were faced with this structure here. And you wanted to know if you put it in a particular shear flow what its period of rotation is. And you'd say, huh, I know the answer for ellipsoids. So let's take this more complicated structure here and approximate it by an ellipsoid that is closest to it. So you may take all of these structures here and find the ellipsoid that, uh, that it is inscribed in. So here, I've drawn these in 3D, but you can actually do a two-dimensional slice. So in fact, this is a trig problem. If you have a rectangle with spines sticking out of it, and you want to draw an ellipse that goes through the edges of the spines, can you find the one of the smallest area that best approximates that? OK, so there's a good, um, there's a good for the middle school program that's here, it's a good, it's a good extra credit problem. So what am I showing you in this graph? Are these calculations necessary? So here, we vary the spine angle, and we look at putting a whole bunch of different number of spines here. And this red curve tells us the period of rotation that we could have figured out 
just by scribble scratching on the back of, uh, of a notepad. These other curves here are telling us what we got after, you know, maybe, maybe uh, four days of 3D calculations. So what we found is that, in fact, for, with these spines here uh, that are at some intermediate angle, the calculations that we got, the back of the envelope calculations that took less than a second, are pretty darn good compared to the full, uh, full 3D calculations. However, when the angle was 0 or 90 degrees, when the spines were sticking straight out in one direction or straight up and down, we got some, we, we, we got different answers. So, um, you know, for, so the answer was, well, maybe we didn't really need to do the 3D calculations, but, uh, but, the, but something better than that, and this is what's fun working with um, actual experimentalists, they had a whole different look of, of this. They said, well, that this is telling them that perhaps um, in, in an evolution point of view, this structure with these spines can achieve the same rotational period using much less biomass than if it filled out an entire ellipse. So they learned, so they learned, so even the fact that these calculations came out so close together to the, to the full ellipse, uh, you can, you can make a statement of, of that, you, you can maybe learn something from that. Okay, so that's what we have here. Here is just a for fun simulation because our, uh, most spines on diatoms, like I told you, they're made of silica and they are pretty, um, they're pre pretty stiff. I'm gonna, our calculations allow flexibility. So here's just a cool simulation if I can show it, where our, we allowed our spines, we just had some fun, where the spines were actually flexible and moved with the fluid. Okay, so I don't, I, I bet you there are creatures like that who move through the fluid. I just want to show you one more, uh, one more simulation where now we looked at the role of flexibility in chains. So we wanted to take these and string them together somehow and couple that with nutrient uptake and try to understand if stiff springs, if stiff chains do better than flexible chains. What do you think? If you were a chain moving around in the ocean and there were bursts of bacteria or, or other nutrients coming that you were going to ingest, what would you rather be? Stiff or flexible? Yeah, well, it's a good thing you're not chains in the ocean. In fact, we, f we found out that, you know, so here are just some simulations of chains at different stiffnesses. These are the most flexible. And each of them had the same random bursts of nutrients near it. And we were able to, to compute how much food they actually got. So as these chains were flipping over, as the chains were flipping over, you see the flexible ones get all messed up. They, they, well, they, they deform much more than the stiff chains. So it, it, turns, it turns out that our calculations showed that stiff chains, maybe because they don't bend so much and crumple on themselves, that stiff chains actually in it, are able to see more of the real estate around them when they're eating things. So here I will, I will end with just some cool simulations in 3D of chains moving around in shear flow. And here is, a, this is full 3D. What you, so you see stuff flashing on and off. What I'm, for the, for the computer and computational enthusiasts, those are grids where we're solving the equation. And we put much we put much more resolution near this fiber, and so you see these grids popping on and off. But there you get a lot of refinement near where that red diatom chain is. So here's a chain that's really stiff, and we're watching it move around. And one that I will end here, looking at diatom chains and shear flow, came to us through talking to actual um, 
biologists. They wanted to understand when these chains buckle and so forth. Now, if I was here and talking to Hans Offmer, who has a chemical engineering background, he would have told me that people, chemical engineers have been looking at fibers in flow since the 1950s. You have not, this is not a new problem. You might be studying diatoms in, sh in, in flow, but chemical engineers certainly want to understand, say, when they're processing pulp fibers to make paper. So I f uh, we found a paper from the 1950s which characterized these fibers in shear flow. And I'll, I'm just going to end with some simulation that we did before we saw this paper, and we thought that our code had completely gone nuts. So here's a much more flexible fiber. We put it in shear, it buckled, and then we lost some symmetry, and it buckled again. And then it started doing this really weird coiling. And if I had seen this paper here about nylon fibers and shear flows from the 1950s, I would have been a lot happier when I thought that something went def terribly wrong with this. So I will end here. And the moral of the story is that there are really intriguing problems in biology and fluid mechanics that are that, that are just now being able to capture using more um, using 3D simulations. And I've hid most of it here because it's 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night. I've hid a lot of the, the important and detailed mathematical modeling and computational algorithms. But I think that there are lots of opportunities for people to do fun work. Thank you. Hey, uh, Professor Fauci will be happy to answer a couple of questions. If there are some from the audience. Anybody? That's a good question. So when I, when I was in, in graduate school in, in, in math, um, I was always really interested in numerical analysis and, and scientific computing. And in, in, in fact, I'll, I'll, there's, I, I wish I could say that I knew exactly what I wanted to study and who I wanted to work with. But I went to a lecture by my, uh, who became my thesis advisor, Charlie Peskin, at at NYU who looked at um, modeling blood flow in, in the heart, which is very similar in spirit to these kind of problems because you have move, elastic heart valves moving in a, in a flow. And I just was really uh, taken. I, I loved his talk. I loved the subject. And he's a, a very wonderful mentor. And I, I, I didn't care exactly what application I wanted to work on. I wanted to work with him. So that's a true, you know, that's a true story. And so a lot of it is, yes, it's a lot of it is thinking about you, you're very interested in this particular science. But in, in life, there's a lot of, you know, pe it, it's, it's people who you want to work with and kind of accidents of whose class you take that semester. So that's a good thing. No, I, I would love to. <laughs> I've, I've been. Like there are problems, right? I yeah. think I think that's right. So th there are problems in the in the bioluminescence there. I did get to spend two long summers in Puerto Rico, a couple of maybe quite a while ago. My husband is a mathematician, and he did an REU program there for two summers, and um, I um, tagged along. So, yeah, I love Puerto Rico. I bring it up in all my lectures. Okay. Okay. You got that, everybody, when you go on your spring break? If there are no further questions, let's thank the speaker again. We have
have uh, forms for you if you need the uh, attendance uh, certification way up there.